welcome to episode 25 of the Group Ride Podcast. I'm your host, Wes Salmon, and it's great to be back after a three-week break while I moved my house and my job. Today's show will be a series of short anecdotes and stories about my move to Southern California and what it means for my cycling experience. So clip in, riders. The Group Ride Podcast is rolling out. Before I start the show, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who sent well wishes, advice, and good vibes during our move. It was an adventurous two days driving with a U-Haul full of computer equipment, essential living supplies, and most importantly, six bikes from Seattle to Huntington Beach. We gave the movers the flat screen TVs, but not the bikes. That's what I call priorities. I'd also like to thank the Group Ride Club members for their continued support of the show. I'm a bit behind on sticker shipments, but now that we've settled in Huntington Beach, we'll get caught up. I'll also be working on a new logo and branding for the show for the next run of stickers and t-shirts. I'll post some ideas on Twitter when I have a few designs that I like. Let's get everyone caught up on why I currently find myself in Southern California. When I started this podcast in January of this year, one of my goals was to get outside of my comfort zone and try new things. I had been at Microsoft since 2002, and while I had learned a lot and worked on some amazing projects, I missed two key things. All up ownership of something really meaningful and working on something I was truly passionate about. I started this show to address both of those shortcomings in my then safe corporate job. Another aspect of my plan was to consider how I could transition in my career to work in the cycling industry. Luckily, many stars aligned, and in a short time, I found myself interviewing for a job for an indoor cycling company, Zwift. Accepting the job at Zwift meant a big change for Summer and I, including a big change in a zip code over 1,000 miles away from Seattle, where we had called home for 18 years. But if chasing dreams were easy, everyone would do it. On August 10th, we headed south to our new home in Huntington Beach, California, less than three miles from the ocean. My goal for the show now that I've changed locations is simple. Keep on finding great people to tell amazing stories about their experiences riding bikes. I suspect my new bike industry job will help me find even more people to talk to, and I'm very excited about that. I've already started setting up interviews with Southern California cycling advocates, personalities, and racers. That said, I'm always interested in what listeners want to hear about. So if you have someone you think would make a great interview, let me know. They can be a small town hero or a major name. I don't mind. I'll ask for the interview because the worst they can do is say no. Less than 48 hours after pulling up to our new place, I found myself setting out for my first exploration ride. I spent a few hours on Sunday testing my bike commute from Huntington Beach to downtown Long Beach. I plotted out a few routes based on the known bike paths on Ride with GPS and I headed out. I only missed one turn during the ride, which isn't bad since I was paying much less attention to my earbud and much more attention to all the new scenery. The bike lanes here are surprisingly wide in comparison to what I've typically experienced in western Washington. This may be because it seems like everything down here is wide. I don't think there is more than a handful of roads in this area that have less than two lanes of travel in each direction. With wider roads and more lanes comes something else, speed. Speed limits here are very, very fast. So fast that even when I'm in my car, I find myself mistakenly driving too slow. Sadly, drivers around me are quick to let me know through horns, tailgating, and one-finger salutes. Granted, my experience on the road so far is hyper-localized, so I'll have to keep track of how this trend continues as I venture further from home. When I wasn't in a bike lane, I was on a dedicated bike path, specifically the bike path which is literally right on the beach. It is separated from pedestrian traffic with dedicated markings and signage to keep bikes on the bike path and pedestrians on the walking and running path. This works pretty well, but it's not 100%, and I've already almost had a run-in with a dog and its inattentive owner. Even so, it doesn't feel nearly as crazy as the shared multi-use trails in Seattle. Riding on the beach is interesting for a few reasons. First, the wind. Even on a normal day, the wind is constantly blowing 10 miles an hour or more in any direction. 
I've gotten some amazing tailwind assists recently, but the headwinds can also be brutal. With the wind comes sand and salt. Longtime listener and former coworker Chris mentioned on Strava when I posted one of my rides that I was going to eat through chains from the sand and the salt. Wow, was he right. It took less than two weeks for my commuter bike chain to start showing rust, even though I haven't even ridden in the rain. My office is close to the beach, but not right on the sand, so at the end of my commute, I have to get back on the roads and ride through downtown traffic. For the most part, this has been pretty easy, because Long Beach is what some would call a lazy downtown. The amount of traffic during rush hour in downtown Long Beach in front of my office is less than you would typically see in front of the Chick-fil-A at Bellevue, Washington on a weekend. In addition to the light traffic, I also find myself splitting traffic more frequently since it's the norm here for motorcycles. Overall, the commuting to and from work has been pretty great. It's between 13 and 15 miles depending on my chosen route, and it's pan flat. Less than 300 feet of climbing for the entire route. I'm debating building up a belt drive single speed just for commuting. Not all of my rides have been commutes, however. Within a week of moving in, my wife and I went to the local cruiser shop and bought a matching pair of beach cruisers, complete with rear racks and front wire baskets. We took a test ride down to the water from our house, less than three miles from door to sand. We rode through a local protected wetlands area on asphalt and gravel and a 15 mile an hour headwind. Once we made it to the water, we turned onto the beach path and rode another four miles down the beach to the fancy mall in downtown Huntington Beach. We had some dinner and then rode home on the streets at a super easy pace. My wife loved it. All told, we rode over 13 miles and my wife didn't feel tired at all. It was certainly a different cycling experience than what she was used to. And it's at this point that I think I should mention something interesting. All of my riding in the Seattle area included aero helmets and tight lycra. This was the norm, and when you saw someone on a bike that wasn't in the kit, they were the oddball. That was not at all the case here. In my bike kit and helmet, I'm the anomaly for sure. I'm the exception, not the rule. When Summer and I rode down to the beach on our cruisers, we were just normal. Just two people on bikes, just like so many other people on bikes. We were just pedaling for fun and transportation. She was even wearing flip-flops, and neither of us had a helmet on. Seeing so many people of all shapes, sizes, and backgrounds on a bike was eye-opening. There seems to be no preset definition for who you would see riding a bike, and this is very cool. After my first week of commuting and beach cruising, I managed to track down a moderately sized group ride led by the newly opened Specialized Store in Costa Mesa. We did a casual 20-mile ride known as the Donut Ride, and as the name would indicate, there were donuts at the end. I was certainly in more familiar territory on this ride, with most of the other riders looking like me in full kit. Only one guy was wearing sandals and riding a mountain bike. One thing that was certainly different about this ride was the people were interested in actually talking to each other. I'm not trying to say that the people in Seattle are antisocial, but for the most part, in Seattle it takes a number of rides with the same group to get to really know people. After this ride, I felt like I had made friends with at least three different people through meaningful conversations during the ride. And that's something that seems to permeate our experience so far. People down here seem to be more likely to say hello as you pass by, and if you're standing in your driveway and they walk by, they stop and introduce themselves. So with that, I have a challenge for all my friends in the Pacific Northwest going out to ride this weekend. Make a point to introduce yourself and really talk to someone you're riding with. Don't just give them your name and where you work. Have a conversation with them before, during, or after the ride. The great thing about riding bikes with other people is the other people part. As I learn my way around the streets of Southern California, I also have to learn the specific California bike laws and customs. My wife sent me a PDF of the California driver's manual since I'll need to take the test to get my license here. I was pleased to see that one of the very first pages of the manual reminds drivers not to run over people on bikes. Then I looked more closely at the picture, and I was horrified by what I suspect is a message that is lost on those who would likely run us down. I'll post the picture on the website, but here's a simple description. You have a smiling middle-aged woman riding a flat bar bike with a nicely fit helmet on her head. Behind her, you have a clearly enlarged black Ford F-150 truck bearing down on her. The text of the picture is, share the road, followed by, big and small safety is for all. Give me a break. 
This picture is the type of picture you'd see in a B-grade horror film about a possessed truck with an appetite for unaware cyclists. And if the message was intended for drivers, I doubt it had much impact, and likely emboldened those who see it and with a sly grin across their face, think about the big truck following so dangerously behind an oblivious cyclist. Maybe I'm reading too much into this. Maybe the page works, I don't know. I do know that nothing about that image or the slogans made me feel safer on the roads. Once I got beyond that poorly done PSA, I started to dig into how the bike laws differed in California from what I was used to in Washington. Here are a few things I immediately took note of. Number one, cars are required to drive in the bike lane before they turn right. This means I need to expect cars all the time. When I read this, I was initially worried, but so far in practice, it hasn't been a real problem. Number two, cars are allowed to park in the bike lanes as long as the vehicle does not block a cyclist. What troubles me about this law is that who decides if I'm blocked? I suspect my opinion on if I'm blocked will differ from the bike lane parker. Number three, motorized bikes can use the bike lane. Now, I'm not sure what a motorized bike is in California, but I will note that just this morning on my way to work, a motorcycle was riding in the bike lane for more than a mile down the Pacific Coast Highway. It was one of those motorcycle slash scooter types, and I suspect she was riding in the bike lane because she didn't feel comfortable riding at the posted 60 mile an hour speed limit, which most people were breaking anyway. Number four, California has a three foot passing law, but hold your applause. It appears there's a caveat in this law that says that drivers can pass closer if they do so slowly and safely. So again, I ask, who determines what's safe? I suspect the person on the bike does not really get a vote here. Number five, bike lane riding is required if a bike lane exists. Of course, the law comes with a standard disclaimer about being legal to leave the lane for a turn, avoiding debris, and for other safety reasons. But my guess is drivers are not likely to consider the nuance here when yelling at me to get out of their way. So that's just a taste of the differences that I can discern from a quick read of the driver's manual. So to summarize my experiences so far, roads are wider, including the bike lanes here. Speed limits are also high everywhere. Spandex and helmets are the exception, not the rule. Riding on the beach will eat your components quickly. And people seem more interested in being social on social group rides. So that's the summary of my first week's living and riding in Southern California. I'm excited to get to know the riders here and understand their bike culture. In the coming weeks, I'm working on interviews with prominent Southern California bike personalities and at least one former UCI pro turned YouTube star. You probably already know who that'll be. Make sure you follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at The Group Ride Pod and like our Facebook page found at The Group Ride Podcast. You can catch up on past shows by going to thegroupride.com where you can also sign up for The Group Ride Club and the newsletter. And finally, if you have feedback for the show, I'd love to hear from you you can email me at podcastfeedback at thegroupride.com. Thanks for listening to episode 25 of the Group Ride Podcast. I'm your host, Wes Salmon. See you on the next Group Ride.